I'm Scott L. Miller, and as an expat living abroad for more than 10 years, it's easy to forget that for a lot of people looking at moving abroad for the first time means they're going to be faced with culture shock. And it doesn't matter where you're going, pretty much any new country is going to have a culture shock. If you're moving from the U.S. to Canada or vice versa, you may be able to avoid that. You may have a really good idea of exactly what you're getting into. But even moving from the U.S. to, say, the to England or, or the U.K., you're probably going to have some amount of culture shock. There's enough different in day-to-day -day life, enough different in how you interact with people, enough different in what's considered socially normal or acceptable or just, just common behavior. That's going to leave you with a little bit of a, whoa, this is not the world I grew up in. Well, with a family looking to move abroad for the first time coming from the United States, I have a viewer question where they're looking at potentially a long-term move out of the U.S., but they want to explore the world quite a bit. We got a lot of wind today. And they're wondering how they can do so here in the Latin American region uh, while minimizing culture shock on their initial move because it's going to be their first time moving abroad and they have uh, middle school children. So I want to talk about just in general minimizing culture shock and look into their specific situation right after the bump. It's a beautiful day here. In Leon, Nicaragua, we have bright blue skies, but a lot of wind, which probably means we'll be getting rain this afternoon, as is often the case. For a lot of you looking to move abroad, one of the things that I want to talk about is how do you minimize culture shock? But I want to get to that in just a little bit. Let's talk about culture shock itself, because this comes in a number of different forms. There can be culture shock simply from being in a new country. I was lucky. I grew up on the U.S.-Canadian border, and crossing into a new country was a very routine thing. So the idea of, and this sounds funny, but switching from miles per hour to kilometers per hour, from U.S. currency to Canadian currency, uh, from from Celsius, from Fahrenheit to Celsius and so forth, all those little things uh, were very common. And there's little things you would never think about until you actually move somewhere and realizing that, for example, every sign's font changes. And you can often recognize what part of the world you're in based on the way that they write their signs, even if you aren't familiar with the language that you're seeing. You can you can look at the way that it's written and say, oh, this, this is style stylistically very Canada compared to the U.S. America likes harsher fonts. Canada really likes more rounded sans serif fonts. That's a funny thing, but even the grocery stores are much more likely to use those fonts. And you really notice when you grow up on the border. At least for me, it was a super obvious thing. And the color schemes change little tiny things, which of course are not going to throw you off. You're not going to have some huge shock. You get the same things moving around the United States to some degree or moving around Canada before coming to the U.S. You can, in many cases, find more diversity inside the United States, moving from, say, Miami to Seattle or maybe more Miami to Des Moines than you're going to get moving from, say, Buffalo to Toronto. It's, so you the national border is not always the thing that has a big shock, but there are these mechanisms of life that when you're in a new country will hit you for the first time. It's for most people the first time that they need to be using a passport on a regular basis. And sometimes that's confusing. You're used to using a driver's license, for example, especially if you're American. Everything is based on the driver's license. And when you go internationally, suddenly nobody cares about your driver's license. It's meaningless. They need to see your passport and your passport's your real ID as an American or, or from anywhere. But in the United States, we don't typically use passports on a day to day basis. People use state level ID cards. And now we have this real ID system, which makes it even less that you would pull out a passport. But if you have a passport, that's your master ID. That's your real national level ID. And most countries, that's the only thing that they will accept or care about in any fashion. So little things like that can be a big shock. And getting abroad, you've got uh, how money works, right? If, you, if you've always lived in one country, uh, the idea that currency means one thing that's based on uh, common usage factors in that country may be very different than how it works on the world stage. This is a, a great learning opportunity. People tend to be very confused about currency and living in different countries and using different currencies on a regular basis really does help to highlight uh, how little the things that people often assume are tied to currency actually are. When people say things like, oh, but you made so much money you were paid in dollars. That indicates they don't understand how currency works. What you're paid in is 100% irrelevant from a how much you earn perspective. It, it is relevant to how easy it is to, to use and different, like you may need to, to transfer it into something that's more usable. If you're paid in British pounds, but you want to buy things in America in dollars, well, then transferring your pounds to dollars is a thing. But whether you're paid in pounds or dollars changes literally nothing. It is a 100% myth, yet 
everybody says it. And sometimes even people who work in multiple currencies, they, they don't always grasp it. But traveling around the world and working, you know, in this region, in Cordobas and Quetzales and pesos and dollars and, and Canadian dollars and Belizean dollars, it becomes very evident very quickly that the misconceptions that most people have about currency are really deep misconceptions and that it means none of those things. So little things like that, many little things like that will come together to form a general shock of just becoming an international person, right? Moving abroad, working in multiple countries, whether it's work, work, or just living in multiple countries, you're going to experience some shock of becoming a multinational person. But none of that is actually shock of the place you're moving to. It's just the shock of no longer being isolated or insulated within a single ecosystem. And, and everyone in the world experiences this. Of course, if you live in, say, Europe, for example, it, the borders are so easy to cross and so nearby that, that it's minimized to quite a strong degree. Whereas, for example, the United States and Canada are so incredibly insular to each other for geographic reasons, mostly, uh, that when you travel abroad from those countries, the shock tends to be dramatic. Other than being between the U.S. and Canada, basically anywhere you're going to travel from them, you're going to have the shock of being in a new geographic region. You're going to be in a new language. All the things are going to change, not just some of them. Now, a quick anecdote from my own family. We've moved around a lot. And the first time that we spent real time away with our children, my wife and I were able to travel. Uh, and we always we went to Canada a lot when we were younger. Uh, we traveled all over the United States. I worked all over the United States and Canada. Uh, and when we first went abroad, abroad, it was to the UK, uh, which is generally seen as uh, the minimized culture shock and way to kind of uh, introduce yourself to the world. That's not why we went there. It just happens to be the place we went first because of my job. Uh, but that that made it really easy to move into the idea of living abroad. And I, I appreciate that we did that. And I don't want to gloss over the fact that that is what happened to us. When I then went further abroad, I went to the Netherlands and Germany as my next places. And those are places that while they are very different than the U.S. in, in countless ways, they also are very easy for the most part, especially for English speakers to move into. German is very easy to read. Uh, the culture is not that wildly different. It's more of a, a heavy tweaking of American. American culture or really vice versa. Uh, compared to being a totally different culture. And the Netherlands is so much closer to the UK and America culture than, than German culture is, and that they speak English nearly everywhere. You can just do everything in English, in, in crystal clear English, really easily. Uh, Germany, you almost can, but in the Netherlands, you totally can. And this is 20 years ago. So uh, those are very ease into them travel places. So I 100%, we had a very non-culture shock introduction to international travel over a long period of time. I, I realized this, and it, it did make, uh, to some degree, our journey easier. However, when we went to those places, we really went to those places. We didn't go for tourist zones. We didn't do tourist things. We did a lot of things where we were getting into the culture and creating more culture shock than a tourist to those places or to many places would often encounter. And when we did first travel with our children, now they were very, very young. My uh, eldest was three. My youngest was just over a year old. And uh, we decided that when we were taking them to Europe for a long time, that we would start in the UK and, and give ourselves a little bit of time, most to acclimate to the time zone change uh, and see friends and do some activities that we wanted to do there. But we, we did want to minimize the huge shock and, and not have that super sleepy. The, the time zone change is big, right? Jet lag is real. And we didn't want to experience that with small children going into a country where we didn't speak the language because we were initially going into Belgium after that. And, uh, and speaking Dutch and French are, are challenging for us. And Belgium doesn't have the huge number of English speakers. Of course, it has many, uh, but doesn't have the incredible number uh, that the Netherlands does. And so, uh, but it's not as bad as France. Um, but uh, uh, we, we didn't want to just jump straight into, into going to Bruges, which is where we were headed next. So uh, we went to uh, England and, and eased into it a little bit. And so that has been our experience. We did do those things. And I, I completely appreciate why uh, there is a concern about hitting culture shock when you go abroad. With the question that came up, right? Uh, they're looking at traveling. This family is looking at traveling throughout Latin America. They have a number of locations over a huge geographic area that they're interested in exploring uh, very slowly over a long period of time. They're, they're really looking at getting to know places, not not going as a you know tourist and, and spending um, a week or two and, and just, you know, enjoying the sites. They're looking at really spending time and kind of living with uh, uh, middle school children 
across a large segment of the world, but they've never done this before. They've never left the US and I'm, I'm filling in some gaps here. I may be wrong on some points. I don't think they've ever done international travel. Maybe they've had their passports in like been one or two places, but they've never really traveled and certainly never lived internationally and not with their kids. So they're looking at some big life changes happening all at once, not just the travel itself, but all the, the accoutrements and, and mechanisms and machinations of life that go beyond that and, and just switching their life phase from being uh, settled in an American city to living uh, across the world as international travelers, right? So that alone, even before you get to the place you're going, is a pretty big life change. So you're going through personal shock, through life shock, even if you're not going through a culture shock, even if they were moving to a copy of America in the farthest point of the world, I guess if they were moving to Australia, right, <laughs> they would be looking at very little cultural change, but huge huge shock from just their lives have changed, right? So that one piece is going on. So minimizing additional shocks at the same time, especially with kids, it was just the adults, probably doesn't matter. But with, you know, middle school age children, this can be a big thing. And so I completely appreciate why they're concerned about this. But I want to look at two countries in the region and talk about what culture shock kind of means and what it can mean for you, right? So when I live here in Nicaragua, Nicaragua is generally listed as a high culture shock country for Americans. We do not exist as a place that Americans can research ahead of time. We're not well known and nearly every aspect of society from just the food we eat to what entertainment is like, to what housing is like, to what the weather is like, to politics and so forth are about as different from the United States as you could possibly be within a small geographic region. You might as well be moving to Asia or Africa like the world is so incredible different here. So culturally, this is an extreme zone. Now, the language is Spanish here. So to most Americans, Spanish is at least not seen as super exotic. You may not know Spanish, but it's easy to read, it's easy to hear, and you've probably been exposed to it a bit, especially in places like Colorado that traditionally, or South, right, Colorado and, and Arizona and New Mexico and Texas and California, all places that were Mexico not that long ago. Most of them were Mexico more recently than Nicaragua was Mexico, right? So it's funny that so much of the Western United States is like, ah, oh, Nicaragua, isn't that like Southern Mexico? And Nicaragua is like, no, you do realize you were Mexico way more than us, right? Nicaragua sees that zone of the U.S. as old Mexico. So it's a funny that each see it the other way, but Nicaragua was free from New Spain and free from Mexico uh, uh, several years, about 15 years before like Texas was, right? So uh, it, it really is. Um, and, and all that's within recent history, right? So the 15 years is pretty significant. Uh, so when you're coming to Nicaragua, other than the language, uh, the, the culture shock is typically pretty high. Just everything is, is very different. And we have all that different currency, uh, kilometers, Celsius, and, and all that kind of stuff. Although people do use pounds from time to time in addition to kilograms. That one's weird. Uh, so, so when you're coming here, we generally list it as a high culture shock. However, it is a very safe, very appropriate, approachable, very free country. So coming here, there's a lot of things that you worry about going into a new country. Ooh, can I do that? Can I do this? How do I behave? You have a lot more flexibility coming into a Nicaragua. So from a, well, I feel safe going out on the street. I can just explore. I can make a lot of mistakes. That doesn't really count as culture shock, but a lot of times people are lumping that in when going to a new place. Will I be able to be comfortable? Will I be uh, safe and not make, you know, simple mistakes and end up getting mugged because I made a simple mistake, right? So places like Nicaragua are extremely good for that because their safety is so high. Uh, there's no target against uh, tourists, any, any significant target. Always, if you're a tourist, you're a little bit more of a target, but extremely little here. Whereas, say, a Costa Rica or a Belize uh, or a Mex uh, Mexico, you have zones where you have to worry about this. Mexico is so big, you have to talk in zones, not Mexico as a whole. If you're looking at, like, Yucatan, you're looking at a lot more crime towards uh, uh, tourists. Whereas, if you're looking in uh, Mexico City, you have a lot less, right? It's, it's more just general crime. Uh, whereas, in, like, Costa Rica, crime is primarily against tourists and, and expats. And if you're here in Nicaragua, crime is primarily in the barrios and in, in poor areas and, and poorly lit inner city streets late at night. Uh, things that you can easily avoid as a tourist, right? If you if you live and work at night in, in very poor barrios as a local, you generally can't avoid the things that would lead to the small amount of crime that is here. Uh, but as a tourist, it's generally quite easy to avoid those situations. Same thing in Guatemala. Tourists are very easily able to avoid uh, situations that are dangerous there, even though the, the average crime is relatively high. So in that aspect, we don't technically think of that as culture shock, but it is an important aspect to consider. So 
Nicaragua is often listed as a really great place as a first time traveler because you can make a lot of mistakes and remain safe and it's very low cost. So those mistakes can include making financially foolish decisions and you won't generally lose everything. Whereas if you're in a, a place like Costa Rica or Belize or Panama, uh, where a little mistake could be quite expensive, right? You may, you're never going to be hit in Nicaragua with a surprise bill of, you know, oh, dinner was not what I was thinking. And it's a, it's a $5,000 dinner. But a lot of the countries around us do have restaurants where you could fumble in, not be able to read the numbers, think, ah, how expensive can it be? And accidentally be spending thousands of dollars on dinner. Just as an example, real estate, everything is just magnified in those countries. So because everything is so inexpensive and there aren't these pockets of crazy expensive in Nicaragua in the way that all of our neighboring countries have you have a certain amount of just general life protections that allow you to be incredibly foolish, incredibly naive, and generally wind up just fine. Feeling foolish, perhaps, but not in danger, not losing your life savings or anything like that. So, uh, so Nicaragua is generally thought of as a very soft introduction to the world. However, the culture shock aspects of it are quite high. So when you're thinking about wanting to minimize culture shock, that's one thing you want to do is, is think about uh, whether you're, you're just going to be surprised by the lifestyle or whether you are looking to remain safe. A lot of people say it and they're actually wanting to protect themselves and don't care too much about the lifestyle, but certainly not everyone and I totally understand why having uh, a minimized lifestyle change as a first introduction to a new country could be important because it gives you an opportunity to get to understand what it means to be in a new country, to work with that passport, to work with new money, uh, to just be outside the United States and, and new Americans moving to new countries. And this is true for people from anywhere, but Americans, especially because they travel so little, they have such a giant zone. They're used to moving between states and being able to say things like, well, I have, you know, X rights or X responsibilities because they're, they're uniform across such a massive zone. When you come to uh, a new country, even Mexico or, or Canada, it can often be a shock that like uh, things you're used to saying, well, I have the right to, and then quoting some American thing. And people will be like, do you, do, you, do you forget what country you're in? You don't have that right. You're a tourist. You're a guest. You have, you have none of those rights. You might be able to get away with those things, but they're not rights. They're just at best privileges and quite often simply just overlooked. Uh, so a lot of those things like working as a person living in another country just comes, doesn't matter what country it is, comes with a different set of mindset, right? The, the different mindset just in general um, and getting used to that with, with minimized cultural change can be quite beneficial. So uh, in the conversation we were have, they mentioned the idea of maybe starting in uh, in Belize uh, as a as a soft introduction to living abroad and minimizing culture shock as they leave the United States and begin this journey. That's a great thought process and it could work out well. Now, I know Belize a bit because I work up there. I was just up there on, on uh, an episode several days ago. I think it was last week uh, I was up there. And then um, I was up there earlier this year, uh, and I work with Belize every day. So Belize is part of the Commonwealth. They speak English, um, and, and it's easy to think of it as a, a soft introduction to the world. And, and many, many, many people uh, go there as tourists and expats because it speaks English. So because of that, they just imagine it's going to be a minimal culture shock. And it's true that primarily speaking English, although the English is incredibly heavily accented and uh, the majority of the population speak Creole, not what we would consider English, and so you will not be able to understand them, but written language is all in English, so it's it's generally pretty easy. There are a lot of Spanish speakers as well because it is mixed in with the Guatemala-Honduras zone, and there's a lot of crossover of people, so it's not uncommon to meet people who only speak Spanish there, but it's not the norm. The majority of the population do speak English Creole and, and to some degree English, uh, but you are going to, uh, if you are experiencing Belize, I think find a culture shock level that equals or surpasses even Nicaragua. Uh, for me, of course, going to Belize because I live in Nicaragua uh, does not uh, uh, get any kind of cultural uh, similarity from the zone. When I go to Belize, it feels like culture shock. Now I'm used to moving around the world. I could move basically anywhere on the planet and culture shock for me would not be a problem or thing that I would really think about. Um, I definitely find those things to just be interesting and exciting, not a, ooh, boy, this is so different. What do I do? Uh, so, but I've moved around a lot. I've been to a lot of countries and spent a lot of my life living in different places all the time. Uh, so 
my, my view of it may be a little bit different, but I think that in general, uh, Belize is going to be a pretty hefty culture shock if you go into Belize proper. Now, they're talking about going to San Pedro or that area out on one of the islands. Now, this is really important to understand is that generally for those of us who live abroad, and we'll use Nicaragua just as an example, uh, and, and Nicaragua isn't even on their necessary list of places that they're going to go. It's just, you know, we talk about uh, becoming an expat and relocation in, in Latin America here quite a bit. So uh, we have a lot of resources for uh, what they're doing. And when you're looking at Nicaragua as an example, we generally talk about the two Nicaraguas. There's Nicaragua that Nicaraguans refer to, and then there are the expat enclaves like San Juan del Sur, Rancho Santana, uh, Grand Pacifica, and so forth, where you can come and technically be under Nicaraguan jurisdiction, be under Nicaraguan law, have Nicaraguan climate and weather, uh, but live in an area that only speaks English, only be around expats, and be super isolated. That's a very common thing. Many people coming to Nicaragua, that is all they're thinking of. And they actually have no idea about the country. They may not know how the currency works. They don't know what the culture is. They don't know what the local food is in many cases. They only know their little isolated areas. And it's weird for those of us who live in Nicaragua to talk to people who may have been there for 10, 20 years and then realize that they don't have even passing knowledge of the country itself. And to be fair, I have barely passing knowledge of the enclave. So it goes both ways. But to them, that is Nicaragua, this, this enclave with culture that is nothing like Nicaragua. It's just a copy, generally generally of Canadian, but to some degree of American culture in this little area. All your neighbors come from the same places that you did. Maybe it's a mix, right? You'll have some people from New York, some from Texas, some from Oregon, some from uh, Alberta, some from, from uh, Nova Scotia, right? So you get that kind of, uh, you know, international sort of blend, but it's a really tight cultural zone, typically all mashed together in a little tiny community with big walls and everything's managed for you. And if you're going to go to Belize, you either you're going to have the exact same thing as Nicaragua. Either you're going to go into Belize that's real, right? Belize City, Belmopan, uh, Orange Walk, right? And live with Belizeans and experience Belizean culture, do everything in Belizean money, deal with all the, the life that goes on in Belize, or you're going to be out on the Keys and be in an enclave, uh, generally a gated community, generally something where everything's managed for you. And technically, yes, you're under a new jurisdiction, you're in a new country, but technically that country is part of the Commonwealth. So you're under the king, this is the same as being in Canada, right? They're all still, I mean, the Commonwealth is, for all intents and purposes, they're colonies of the UK that have agreed not to be called colonies anymore, but they still have the king. They're still ruled by the UK, uh, whether, you know, they admit to that or Canada loves to say that that's not going on. But as long as the king is your king and it's the British king and not your king, we're just semantics trying to say it's anything else. It is full on part of the UK. The Commonwealth is just the reference to its global empire. And so when you are... Um, and, and this never more more uh, noticeable than the UK just initi initiated visas. So Canadians have to have a digital visa. They're trying to claim it's not a visa, but it is in every possible sense, a digital visa. Canadians and Americans now require a digital visa to visit the King of England. Now, for Americans, it's completely a separate country because they're not under the, the Commonwealth. But for Canadians, which are a member of the Commonwealth, their head of state sits in London and they have to have a tourist visa approved to be allowed to go there to see their own government. If anything has ever made it clear that the UK thinks of Canada as a colony, this is it. Canadians can say they're not, but the rest of the world 100% has no idea anyone would consider them anything but a colony. This is a shocking amount. This goes into effect January 1st. We're going to do an episode for all the Americans, Canadians to understand what the requirements are for traveling to the UK because we're used to being able to go at the drop of a hat. Now you have to have three days approval on a digital visa. Wow, which is not a big deal, uh, but it is annoying if you're a last minute traveler, but you can get it approved ahead of time and it is good for a good period of time. We're going to cover that later. So if you're going to Belize, though, I want to really highlight this, that when you're going to expat enclaves, this could be Panama, Costa Rica, even here in Nicaragua, up in Belize, basically anywhere in the world, if that's in a, you know, now if you're going to Spain, chances are it's going to be a British enclave. So it'll be a bit different. But if you're coming anywhere here in the new world, the enclaves are almost completely universally some mix of American and Canadian. Up in Belize, mostly American. Down here in Nicaraguan, mostly Canadian but the differences are minor. Uh, when you go into those enclaves, the culture that you're going to be experiencing there is not going to be 
exactly the culture that you're used to in the US or Canada. So there is a culture shock. However, it's also not the culture that you're going to experience in Belize proper, in Nicaragua, or around the world. You're experiencing this weird resort living thing that is a uh, subset of American culture just under ju different jurisdictions. And so from this, I think that it's uh, uh, necessary to, to kind of contextualize what kind of culture shock and learning and experience you will receive by doing this. Uh, you will ease yourself into the mechanisms of being international, but you will unlikely experience culture of being international. You won't have the experience of visiting Belize. Of course, you can exit your enclave and go dabble in Belize and come back, but you have to take a ferry somewhere to do that. It's a lot of money. It's very expensive. Uh, going to outrageously expensive zones that would rival the U.S. in cost. Uh, real estate in Belize is absolutely phenomenally expensive. And, uh, uh, and experiencing this surrounded only by foreigners I don't know that this in any way assists in becoming international uh, because you're surrounding yourself with people who are isolating themselves from culture shock. That's really what the enclaves are in, in a nutshell. Uh, in some ways, enclaves are kind of nutshells of life. Uh, these are people who sometimes just want luxury. That's fine. But in most cases, these are people who are afraid or or dislike the cultures that are around them and want to be isolated from them. They want their weather. They may want some cost or tax advantages. Lots of reasons why you might want to do it. Maybe they just want to go scuba diving on a regular basis. Maybe the view is just fantastic. Maybe it's closer to family or whatever. But these are people choosing to be completely apart and isolated from the culture. They're removing the culture shock of everyday life. And if you do that as an introduction to traveling internationally, one, I don't think it's going to fix anything with culture shock. When you then move on to real places, it might actually be worse because you're going to have been introduced to the concept of being international without actually being international. And that might set up a mindset that's just a little bit hard. I'm not saying it's going to cause big problems, but if your goal is to minimize how scary it is to go into, you know, let's say rural Mexico or, or you know, Western Panama or, or the mountains of Colombia, then going to an enclave on an island surrounded by only expats in English-speaking Belize may give you this sense of, oh, the world's all this uniform thing. And you could bounce between enclaves in every country in the world and have that uniform experience and never experience those countries, never experience culture, never experience anything. You'll spend a fortune, but you'll never get to that moment of having culture shock. There's easing into places where you experience some of the culture shock, but not all of it. And then there's avoiding the culture shock which if you plan to never experience a new country, then you can avoid culture shock. If that's something you're afraid of, yeah, you can avoid it forever. And many, many, many people coming to Nicaragua and Costa Rica, that's what they do. They build these bubbles, they live in the bubbles, and they have no intention of ever leaving them. They're not easing into those countries, they're avoiding those countries, but they like something about them. If your goal, and this is the goal of the viewer who, has, who said this, they want to be able to live in all these places, but they don't want to you know, get hit really hard all at once with the culture. Personally, I think that's kind of a mistake. I think jumping in and immediately immersing yourself has some really big benefits. And from then on, the idea of culture shock basically goes away for most people. Uh, but but I understand why you may not want to do that. And I got away without doing that myself. So I would be a little bit disingenuous to be like, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. I did. It worked out for me. But um, but I think completely avoiding it doesn't do anything, right? If you are easing in, right, you're coming to a place that has some of the differences, but not all the differences. And it's, it's a little bit more like where you came from, but still a completely new place. And you're not avoiding anything. I think you're going to ease into, I think that actually is what easing into looks like, but going to an enclave, all you're doing is creating, you know, instead of, of moving towards a goal, you're moving not away from it necessarily, but you're not moving towards it. You still got to get to that goal. And whenever you leave the enclave, whenever you then go actually move to a new country, you're going to go through all the culture shock that you were trying to ease into originally. You're not gonna have eased into anything. It's all still waiting. You're delaying the culture shock, but you're not, you're not lessening the culture shock. So I don't think that's really uh, a useful approach. Nothing wrong with going and enjoying enclaves. You wanna just take some time and vacation. Understand that basically that's what you're doing, right? Enclaves are like a permanent vacation in a full on mental vacation mode. And it's fine to go to Disney World and be like, this is just what I wanna do for a few weeks. I don't care, but it's not, 
introducing you to Floridian culture. You're not going to become more of a Floridian by spending time in Disney World. Same thing. You go to an enclave or a resort, an all-inclusive anywhere in the world, you're not going to become more a part of that place. Sure, some of their fruits and vegetables might get into your diet a little bit, but that's about the extent of it. You're not going to you're not going to really pick up any uh, cultural aspects or prepare yourself in any meaningful way. So my advice there is that anything that's enclavey, anything that's dramatic like that, anytime you're going around other uh, tourists, other expats that you're mixing those concepts together, I think you're in an avoidance mode and you're going to completely defeat the goal of easing in. So if I was going to ease in and we were looking at Latin America as the location that we were talking about, and you're coming from the US or Canada, North America, North Americans looking to the Latin American zone specifically, and I wanted to ease in and legitimately experience a new culture, avoid the enclaves, not be around other tourists, not be around uh, or not be not be isolated with with other expats. Where would I go? Clearly, I wouldn't choose Belize. I don't think it matches any of the normal goals. It's not going to be good for uh, cultural assimilation. It's not good for safety. It's not good for cost. All those things are negative uh, from that perspective. It's a great country, lots of wonderful people. There's reasons to go there. Certainly go visit Belize, and we're going to keep doing shows on Belize. And, and there's reasons that, you know, some people just can't handle new languages. Certainly that's the the obvious place that you're going to go in in the Western Hemisphere. But if you're looking for uh, easing into Latin America, I think it is absolutely the one of the worst choices you could make. It's going to provide none of the benefits, possibly make things harder, and certainly just be expensive and, and unnecessarily uh, uh, rough. It will, if you go into real Belize, go live in Belize City for a while, you will certainly have a culture shock. You'll experience probably more culture shock than coming here to Nicaragua not necessarily in ways that you would want, right? We can throw you into the barrios of, of Managua as well and force you to go through some pretty serious culture shock, but coming to even Nicaragua, that's not normally what we would recommend, but neither of these countries are at all good for this. So where is? So if I'm coming from North America and I wanna get an introduction to Latin America and I want to minimize the cultural shock of the whole thing, just the, the entire like transition process, where would I recommend going? Well, I think there's actually a really good choice here that gives you a better mix of things where you're able to feel a little bit less like you're jumping completely into a new world while not actually doing anything to hold yourself in your old one. And that choice is Buenos Aires, Argentina. Why Argentina? What makes Argentina so special here? Well, one is the city of Buenos Aires. This is a massive modern city. So if you're coming from big modern American cities, the actual feeling of the city is going to be different for sure, but it's going to have the neighborhoods, the feel of just large cities that you're going to have anywhere. So you're not going to have this huge shock from the actual layout of the city. And if you're coming from North America, you're used to the temperate zone. Argentina falls very much into a temperate zone and has weather and climate much like the majority of the United States and a little bit of Canada. This is different compared to most of Latin America, which is going to fall into the tropics and is going to be surprising weather and climate uh, to those coming from North America. So that also uh, is, is kind of a big thing. And it's something that you don't realize how much those things can, can be a part Part of your culture shock. Uh, but, uh, you know, someone we had recently on the show came to Nicaragua and they were completely unable to handle little things like the what should be, in theory, well-known, because we're all taught this in elementary school, changes in how long the sun shines, right? If you're in the on the equator, the sun shines 12 hours on, 12 hours off, and it never varies. And if you're, uh, you know, in, in the Arctic or Antarctic, it, it could be 12, uh, six months at a time, six months off. Uh, and in other zones, it just gets some days are longer, some days are shorter. And uh, so when you get towards the tropics, we've had people who just couldn't handle the even days. They were completely thrown off by this uh, and felt... It felt it was more than they could handle. And that's a surprising thing. But these little tiny things can be a lot when you're dealing with just an, an all new environment. So with Argentina, you get an extremely European feeling city. It could easily be mistaken as a Paris, a Madrid, a Rome, uh, but it's in Latin America and speaks a Latin American Spanish or something very analogous to it. A lot of Spanish speakers would be like, I don't know if I'd really call it Spanish, but it sounds an awful lot like Spanish one way or another. But going to Argentina, you could get into uh, kind of a more things like North America kind of feel in day-to-day -day interactions, um, especially with availability of service 
services, right? This is a giant country that traditionally has a massive economy. And so they have a lot of just the things and, and do things in a way that North Americans are going to feel a lot more comfortable with, the way that uh, restaurants work, the way that public transportation works, the way that uh, you just interact with, with society is much more North American in feel. And the the big change, you know, one, you're, you're definitely in a new country. Uh, so there's all those, you know, kilometers and Celsius and all that kind of stuff. And you're going to be listening to a lot of Spanish. However, unlike a lot of the Spanish speaking world, Argentina has a very high incidence of English speakers. So if you're in a situation where you just need to uh, talk to someone in English, you're going to have a breakdown, or you're just in a situation where you can't communicate and you need someone who speaks both English and Spanish, you're going to have a really good availability of that. You don't have this no one speaks English problem that you can run into in some places. Now, lots of the Latin world also have lots of English speakers. That's not generally too big of a challenge, but people coming here to Central America often are surprised by just how few English speakers there actually are. We have enough that you can generally find someone when you need it, but it can be a challenge. And especially if you go to a smaller village, you could end up in a place that really doesn't have any. For many people going to a new country, one of the things that hits them very hard is the change in available food. Uh, if you're going to someplace like Belize, you're going to be suddenly hit with a very Caribbean diet and very low uh, uh, availability of a variety of food. It may be a little bit better than here in Nicaragua, at least out here in Leon, uh, but compared to like Managua, Belize has not even a fraction of what Managua does, and all of Nicaragua, we complain about a lack of food variety pretty much. But going to someplace like Argentina, you're going to have essentially all the variety that you are used to in North America. It'll be skewed a little bit. There's some things that are very popular in North America that you'll struggle to find and some things available that you're not used to finding. But in general, you're going to have a lot of restaurant chains, restaurant types and food types that will mimic what you're used to. And it'll make it easier to adapt because you have variety to work with. If you're here in Nicaragua and you don't like Gallo Pinto, you don't like churrasco, there's going to be a few items that if those are not things you want, and I'm vegetarian, so churrasco is not on my option list. Uh, by, by being in a place like Argentina, you have a lot of food options and you can adjust much more easily. Even if you do need to adjust, you have a lot more to work with. It's much easier to find something that you'll like rather than depending on just that one or two items that is available in the country that you're in, in the majority of restaurants. Of course, cooking at home, you always have options, right? No worries. Terrible, but some places like Nicaragua and Belize are going to have a lot of food limitations that you'll have to learn how to creatively work around, which of course you can do, but it takes time to go to Argentina. You simply show up in Buenos Aires and the chances that you're not going to find a lot of amazing food is implausible, right? There's just so many options. It's such a large city with so much going on. And of course, if you want to live in the big city, you have that. You want to be downtown and you want to be in a, an apartment. You want to get a house in the suburbs, but be on the train line. You want to be out in the country. You have a lot of things you can experiment with, with which is within a relatively small zone. In many ways, Buenos Aires would remind you of a Chicago where it has a freshwater waterfront. It's in a area that would remind you of the Midwest and has weather and a lot of things uh, similar to it. But at a larger scale uh, even than Chicago. So I think Argentina really represents a good option from a culture shock perspective, possibly the best that you're going to find in all of Latin America for people coming from North America. The the language thing almost seems like the, the best possible scenario because you hear Spanish every day, but you will have available of English when you need it, as opposed to skipping all of that and then being hit with a full on culture shock going into a new language zone when you leave an English speaking country even if it's a different one. Uh, I also think it's very important, like we said with Nicaragua, Argentina similarly has very low violent crime. It's one of the safest countries in Latin America uh, and, and um, is very low cost right now, very low cost of living. In the past, Argentina has been quite expensive. This actually makes it a, a uh, very... Uh, prescient option that you can get into Argentina and spend time there without spending a ton of money. In the past, when I was a kid, Argentina was unaffordable. It was super expensive. It was a luxury destination that only those who were really willing to take, you know, cuts at home or really willing to spend a lot were able to leverage. But today it's not the case. It's uh, in a unique position uh, in, in time and in the financial world in which you can really take advantage of, of the way that things are in Argentina and live there quite inexpensively. Uh, and that 
that may not come back in our lifetime. So if you're looking to explore Argentina, of course, this isn't going to disappear in months. It's been going on for years, but they are trying to correct it. And in time, it probably will correct. So you may want to take advantage of that for other reasons as well. Just a good opportunity to get into Argentina while it is exceptionally affordable. And of course, being an expat in Argentina and spending your money there does help in a tiny way. It's a very large country, so you can't make a personal giant impact, but it does help move them towards uh, financial recovery as you are able to feed a small amount uh, of money into their financial system. Overall, I do think that fears of culture shock are a little bit overblown. Most people don't need to worry about it as much as they do. You think that it's going to be really bad, and of course, your first day, it can be. But once you're in a new country for a number of days, generally that stuff starts to go away. Most of us adapt pretty quickly, and kids especially have a tendency to adapt very quickly. If you think about going on vacation and go to a new country, a completely new place, and there is a bit of shock when you do that, that shock of visiting on your, your travels is typically the majority of what you're going to encounter. Once you're in a place, a lot of that's going to fade away. You're always going to have that, I'm in travel mode, I take a bunch of culture shock. But once you get an apartment, start living someplace and start spending your time there, even in just a week or two, you're quickly going to get used to the fact that things are in kilometers, that you're spending with a new currency, the Argentinian peso, for example, that people speak with different language, that will stop being surprising and just being a little, start being just a little bit of a challenge. You'll start learning that language, you'll figure out how to communicate with people, you'll realize that in most cases you don't need need uh, to speak the language. I know people who've lived here in Nicaragua for many years and, and don't speak Spanish in any meaningful way and do just fine. It's not necessarily a big thing. It seems like it would be. And of course, you want to learn the language of anywhere you're going to go. It's going to make it a much more meaningful experience for you. And that's a benefit to a lot of the places you might be considering going. But it's not a requirement, and I, I think it feels like so much more of a scary thing or a thing that's going to be a shock or something that's going to be intimidating than it typically really is. But I know until you actually do those things, they remain very scary, and they can be a big shock. So you do want to consider how a culture shock is going to impact you and your family, uh, but I think that, um, one, going to things like enclaves is counterproductive at best uh, or at worst and is is neutral and not useful at best. If, if, for, if nothing else, it's just delaying the culture shock you're going to have to go through anyway. Best to pull off the Band-Aid and just get it done. But at worst, it solidifies a feeling of living abroad in a way that you don't interact with the culture and you get used to this avoidance mechanism. And I think that has a lot of potential to bring negatives if you ever want to move past that. If you never want to move past that, you want to live in an enclave and never interact with other cultures forever, then absolutely that is the way to go. You have to, there's no other way to do that. But as long as you want to have the benefits of interfacing with, learning from, being a part of another culture, then avoiding that process only lessens the amount of time that you get to take benefits from that. If you are going to do that, the sooner you do it in your life, the more you will be able to integrate, the more opportunity you'll have to enjoy those things, the more cost savings you'll have. You want to start getting those benefits as early as possible because they will extend throughout your life. You're only ever going to go through that culture shock, at least in, in a new region, once in your life. And generally for just a few weeks, it's going to be a very small thing. Most people moving here to Nicaragua, yeah, the first week or two, maybe even the first month can be a lot of adjusting. But most of it is not going to be culture shock. Most of it is going to be you adjusting to your new life and, and having a life shock, that's that's legit, right? We, we had the video about the, the expat disease, right? A lot of expats move to Nicaragua and just take up drinking, right? And napping as, as new hobbies. And you're like, maybe that's not the healthiest thing to do. And they're adjusting to their life changing so dramatically. And they're not sure how to fill their time that they used to spend going to work or whatever. And now they're able to do things they weren't able to do before. Yes, those life shocks are there, but those are not culture shocks. Those culture shocks, learning how to use the grocery store, learning how to get an apartment, how to pay your rent, how to go to the bar and talk to people, how to interface with your neighbors, those things pretty quickly are going to get past any shock. And then, yeah, there's going to be a learning curve that goes on for a really long time. And that's just part of, you know, slowly integrating into a new environment. I've been here in Nicaragua for a total of 10 years, uh, almost four years solid without really leaving in any meaningful way. And I still every day I'm learning more, becoming better, learning Spanish more. Uh, and, and every day I'm more a part of Nicaraguan society and it's still neat to go out and experience more of it and new things and, and so forth. But the shock, the, the, the big, like, like, 
it's hard to deal with things. That was over in a few days. Uh, and I don't know that I could have really done much of anything to lessen that. Now, again, I did, you know, those UK trips and stuff and, and Netherlands trips and German trips long ago. And that did give me a soft introduction to the concept of traveling internationally. And so I do appreciate that 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 did make some of these things easier. And those are things you can do pretty quickly and easily. But I don't think taking any serious amount of time uh, to spend somewhere is going to offset uh, culture shock in the way that people imagine that it will. But I do think for those looking at coming to Latin America, if you are fearful of that shock, and that's a real thing, and you do think your family would benefit from being in a place that will give you a soft introduction, seriously consider Buenos Aires. It's a wonderful city. It has a lot to offer. And if nothing else, it gives you a new place to discover and learn about it and about yourself and prepare for the next place. And it's inexpensive and safe. So if you're going to get stuck there for some amount of time, maybe you can't decide where to go afterwards or you need to save up before you can do a big family flight again, then it's a great place to get stuck because you're safe and you're not bleeding out a whole bunch of money because you accidentally got stuck in an expensive place uh, or a place that doesn't have a lot to offer. It's huge. You have a huge city. You have a huge country to explore. And even without leaving Argentina at all, staying within the borders, you have basically a lifetime of exploration to do. And if you want to take quick trips to explore other countries, this is also a big deal. It's just a 45 minute ferry ride away. Maybe it's a little bit longer. Maybe maybe it's a 45 minute plane ride. Maybe it's a couple hour ferry, but there's a ferry from Buenos Aires that goes to Montevideo, Uruguay, and that gives you another country to explore. And it's easy to take a bus to Chile. And it's not that hard to go to Paraguay and Brazil. Those are a little bit of an effort, but not that bad. Uh, but you, know, you have at least three countries that are the whole Southern cone easily accessible so you can do a little bit of that. Okay, so Argentina was like this, but the next country is going to be another culture shock, right? Go to Uruguay, go to Chile and say, oh, okay, they are different, but I don't really feel a shock. I might be surprised by the brand in the grocery store. I might be surprised that there's no Burger King here, but instead there's a Pizza Hut, right? Little things will be there, but those big culture shocks, you're going to quickly realize don't exist anymore, uh, and, and you can really easily go to lots of new countries. Now, if you go to Brazil, there's going to be a new language. You'll be like, whoa, this isn't Spanish. Okay, that's, that's surprising. Right? But you probably won't experience a huge shock. You know it's going to be a new language. You'll get there and go, okay, cool. Actually, I can use Portuguese more than I realize because I know a little bit of Spanish now. I'm really comfortable with this. So thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Miller. And as always, we have the uh, join button down there if you want to uh, join the channel and have a small monthly uh, contribution to help make all of this possible. I really appreciate all my, my members. And if nothing else, I get down in those comments. Say hello, ask questions, send in your video questions. I really appreciate when I get those. Um, and a uh, shout out to Mark, who was on the show, I want to say about a month ago, he sent in a video question uh, and we put him on. And then we actually ran into each other at the Doubletree in Managua just a couple days ago. So he and his wife were there. I think they were with their kids, but they, I didn't get to meet their kids, but it's so cool. Getting, we actually saw each other across the bar in Via Fontana, like not a spot I was expecting to run into one of my audience. And uh, <laughs> I'm like, wait a second, he's really familiar. And he kind of looked at me and I'm like, okay, he definitely recognizes me. It was very funny. Uh, and um, so that was very cool. Uh, always appreciate getting to meet you guys and speak to you and put you on the show. But he had sent in a video, so that's why I mentioned it. Uh, and of course, if you just watch another video, that helps out a lot as well. Thanks for joining me. I will see all of you tomorrow.